Good morning, everyone, and welcome. It's my honor and pleasure today to welcome the Reverend Josh Woods as our preacher and guest on campus. Josh is a graduate of the seminary, distinguished and illustrious. He's the rector at Church of the Reconciliation in San Antonio, and he's going to be here uh, all day to uh, talk with anyone who would like to about the program in military chaplaincy and opportunity in chaplaincy in the armed forces. So welcome, Josh, and thank you for being here. O oh God, make speed to save us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Let us pray together Psalm 24, verses 1 through 6, in unison. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, and the world and those who live in it. For he has founded it on the seas and established it on the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false and do not swear deceitfully. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from the God of their salvation. Such is the company of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Glory to the holy and undivided Trinity, one God, as it was in the beginning, is now, now and will be forever. Amen. Amen. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Thanks be to God. Lord, have mercy. Lord have mercy our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, you made us in your own image and redeemed us through Jesus, your Son. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love. And work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth, that in your good time all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign, 
now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, we pray for the bishops of your holy church, especially for the Right Reverend Morris Thompson, Diocese of Louisiana. With our family in the Anglican Communion, we ask you, Father, to bless our common life. Today, we especially give you thanks for the Anglican Church of Quebec in South Sudan and their bishop, the Right Reverend Elijah Muteni Awet. And now, O oh Lord, we offer you our thanksgivings and petitions with our lips and in our hearts. Pray for the peace in this country, for healing, for goodwill among nations, for all who are dear to us whom we commend to your prayers. O God, whose blessed Son came into the world that he might destroy the works of the devil and make us children of God and heirs of eternal life, grant that having this hope we may purify ourselves as he is pure, that when he comes again with power and great glory, we may be made like him in his eternal and glorious kingdom, where he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Please be seated for the reading from Scripture. A reading from Luke. Jesus said to his disciples, Occasions for stumbling are bound to come. But woe to anyone by whom they come. It would be better for you if a millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea than for you to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If another disciple sins, you must rebuke the offender. And if there is repentance, you must forgive. And if the same person sins against you seven times a day and turns back to you seven times and says, I repent, you must forgive. The apostles said to the Lord, increase, your, increase our faith. The Lord replied, Be uprooted. The word of the Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, I didn't grow up in the Episcopal Church. Um, and sometimes I forget that because I've been in the Episcopal Church for so long now that it seems like the majority of my adult life. Former community, until a day like today where I read a passage from the scriptures and all of a sudden I'm forced to think the way that I used to think. This week when I read the passage for this tasks, 
And I think back to my time uh, in the Pentecostal church, and I realized that one of the reasons that we read things so literally is because we weren't necessarily at that time, or at least I wasn't, we weren't very interested in context. The Bible for me in that time was like a magical manual. I'd open it up and I would flip to any page and there would be divine wisdom, exactly what I would need for that particular day. But the older that I get, and hopefully the more mature that I get, the more that I realize that the Bible is not a magical manual. And context matters. And so I looked at this passage today in Luke 17, and I looked back, and I'm realizing that this is part of a larger scope of teaching, beginning all the way back in Luke 14. Jesus is talking to a large crowd that has accumulated. These are not necessarily the most dedicated followers. These are not necessarily people that are following him from town to town. These are people who are gathering to hear the next thing that he will say and possibly see the next miraculous thing that he will do. And Jesus begins to teach, and he begins to share stories and parables. And he tells them about the lost coin and about the lost sheep. He tells them about the prodigal son and the dishonest manager. And he kind of goes down the greatest hits of the parables. And people are listening. And for the most part, it's just kind of a normal day. But around chapter 16, a group of Pharisees show up and they begin to ridicule Jesus. And they begin to challenge Jesus on the things that he is saying. And Jesus just responds by telling another parable. He tells them the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. And then finally, in Luke 17, Jesus turns his attention away from the general crowd, the non-specific followers. He turns his attention away from the people who are there to challenge or to ridicule. And he turns his attention to the disciples those who are intimately involved in his life, and he begins to teach them. The question is, when he gave this teaching, was he intending for his disciples and for us, a future audience, to take these teachings literally? Let's look at what he says. Jesus first tells them that sin or stumbling, falling short, whatever you want to call it, all of that's going to happen to you. You can't avoid it. No one is perfect. But the real trouble begins when you cause someone else to stumble, when you cause someone else to falter, when you cause someone else to fall short. And the, the warning that he issues is for when this happens to the most vulnerable of people. Jesus refers to these as the little ones. And then he goes on to tell them that if a fellow disciple, well, if they sin, or if they fall short, or if they stumble, that it's the responsibility of another disciple to go to him or her and to rebuke them and give that person a chance for repentance and for you to offer forgiveness. And then the passage gets even more difficult because he tells them if this same person comes to them seven times in the same day and sins again and again and again but says, I repent afterwards, well, then it becomes our responsibility to forgive. It doesn't take a biblical genius to understand that this could be a really hard passage pastorally to tell people in our congregations. That this could be something that we don't want to saddle ourselves as Christian leaders in the church. That we are not meant to be just forgiveness machines. That it doesn't matter how people treat us or talk to us or how they sin against us. That it is our only obligation to just hear them say, I repent and then forgive them. In fact, my belief is that this sets us up and the people that we lead in the church for great harm. So then how are we supposed to understand it? I think I go back to the very first line where Jesus first turns to the disciples and he tells them, listen, occasions for stumbling, they happen to all of us. And this is, in some ways, the good news of this passage because Jesus is telling his disciples and us today that none of us are going to be perfect. And that was something I had to lose. Uh, uh, it was a uh, illusion, I think, that I carried into seminary. That one day I would be a perfect leader. That if I only spent enough time listening to Scott's ethics and Cynthia's preaching and James' teaching on the New Testament, that somehow I would be formed into a person that no longer made mistakes and that when I finally graduated and I was ordained, I would go to a church and I would no longer harm people and I would no longer stumble, 
and I would suddenly be the person I was called to be. But Jesus shatters this illusion. He tells us we are all imperfect. But the trouble begins not when we fail, not when we fall, but when we call others to do so. The responsibility here to me is not to be a forgiveness machine, but this is a teaching about what it means to live in Christian community, what it means to live with other people who also desire to live into the reality of the kingdom of God. Too often we read this passage and we place the focus only on the ability or the, the command to forgive. But there's a whole process at play here because we are also supposed to be open to rebuke. We are also supposed to be open to our own repentance. And then we are also supposed to be open to forgiving others who are also open to repenting and rebuke. I am not a perfect person. And those of you uh, who've known me for more than a couple of years probably know that. But I think back to my time here in this place and the relationships that I built with students who went through the seminary with me. And there are relationships that I built at that time that have proved invaluable to me because I am oftentimes blinded by my own privilege. I'm blinded by my own position. I'm blinded by my own limited experience. I'm blinded by many things. And so the benefit of living is in community is that I'm surrounded by people with other experiences, with other types of privilege, with other types of positions. There are people who I went through seminary with that I call on a daily basis, and sometimes I have to repent, and other times they have to rebuke me, and mutually we get to forgive one another. This passage ends with the disciples hearing the teaching and almost in unison, they say, Lord, increase our faith. And maybe this is the only appropriate response to any of Jesus' teaching. All of it seems too grand. All of it seems too miraculous. Sometimes it seems backwards and upside down to our own ideas of what is common sense. But Jesus reminds his disciples that it's not the amount of faith they have. It's not the quantity. It's not the size. Because even just a little bit, is enough to do great and miraculous things. As I look out on this mot and I look at Christian leaders going forth into the church, I think just what I want to tell you today is that you are invited into that same Christian community. You are already living presently in it. But it takes us all being willing to rebuke, to repent, and to forgive. And the responsibility does not fall only on you. This is a passage about relationship and what it means to live in a community where we aspire to live into the reality of the kingdom of God. Oftentimes when I read passages like this, I wonder if I have enough to accomplish it, if I'm even able to, if this is something that I should read literally or aspirationally. And I find hope in Jesus' reminder that it's not the amount of faith that I have, it's not the amount of talent that I have, it's not my ability to exegete scripture, it's not anything in my own capability but it's just the smallest amount of faith that has brought each and every one of you here to this place that makes it possible to do great things amen amen